From selfish ambition to selfless mission. Lost, found Mandy, met Jesus, lived. Silenced, now I roar on paper. Every life tells a story, and you're telling yours right now. And one day that story will come to an end, and it will say, I was here. This is what I believed. This is what I valued. This is who I was. Now, I believe that you were created to tell a story with your life that matters, a story that's unique. I believe that you were created to live a story that will birth something into this world that will make life better for others. I believe that you are here to tell a story with your life that will glorify the God who gave you life and change the lives of others so that they too might know his goodness and his grace. And I believe that story, unlike any other story you can tell, will fulfill the deepest longings within your heart. So the question is, is that the story that you're living? Or is it time to flip the script and to begin to tell a different story? Now, as you know, we're starting today this new series, The Story of a Lifetime. And the little tagline is, your life is your message. And over the next few weeks, we're going to look at five different stories, five different lives that lived in a way that was impactful and that made a real difference. Some are big lives that you'll know about, others are much smaller. And the reason we're going to look at those is not so we can say, well, that's the story I want to live, but so we will be inspired by their example to live full out purposefully and passionately for the story that God created us to tell. You've heard stories already. The three that were shared in that bumper, I want to thank uh, Alba and, and Pete and Sarah, and you may not have heard, but uh, Meredith shared her six-word story right at the end. My scars have become my testimony. You have a story to tell, and I'm hoping that this series will help you think intentionally about what you want that story to be, because your life is your message. Now, that idea came to me several years ago when I was in India. I was standing in a museum on the grounds where Gandhi had been assassinated. It's really impossible to walk onto those grounds without having a sense of wonder and awe. If you know something about his life and what he was able to achieve, how he determined that India would be set free from the colonial rule of Great Britain, and that he would force Great Britain to leave this jewel in the crown their prized colony, the one that was their greatest source of wealth, that they would simply walk away from India without a fight. And he was able to do that by the moral authority of his life. And I didn't know about this encounter, but there on the wall of the museum, I read that a journalist once asked him the question, what is your message to the world? And Gandhi's response was, my life is my message. And when I read that, I was literally mesmerized, and I thought, you know, it was. I mean, he, he called upon his followers to, to live nonviolently, and that's how he lived. He told them to stand up against oppression, even if it was costly, and he did. But at the same time, he told them to treat their oppressors the way they wanted to be treated, and he did that. He told them to be willing to suffer for their beliefs, and he suffered for his. And I thought, you know, how remarkable to be able to say, my life is my message. But as I thought about it more, I realized that that wasn't remarkable. Uh, what was really remarkable about Gandhi is that what he believed, what he thought he believed, what he said he valued, his life lined up with that. Because the truth is, every one of us, our life is our message, Think about it with me. If a father tells his child, I love you, but is never there for that child, what is his message? His words or his life? 
If we tell our spouse, you mean the world to me, but we are inattentive or critical, never supportive, what is our message, our words, or our life? If we say that integrity is first, but we're willing to sell out our moral principles for material gain, if we tell others that we follow Jesus, but we live like everyone else, what is our message, our words, or our life? It's our life, isn't it? And so I want to encourage you to think about the life that you're living. Is that the message that you believe you were created to bring into the world? What if somebody were to follow you around every minute of every day for a month in a non-creepy, non-stalker kind of way? (laughs) They just observed you every minute for a month. They took notes on where you went, what you did, how you spent your money, how you spent your time, what you looked at. Uh, what you read, uh, how you did or did not nurture certain relationships, how you did or did not serve others, how you did or did not pursue God, what would that observer conclude about what is truly important to you, the message of your life, what you value? Imagine this, it's your last day on earth and you know it. And so you bring those who are close to you around. If you have children, you bring them. If not, you bring family members and friends. And you begin to say goodbye. And somebody says, wait a second, before you leave us, before you go to be with God, tell us what's most important. Tell us what you've learned. Tell us what's most valuable. What is the message that you will leave us with? What would you say? It's an interesting question, I think. But a more important question is this. Is the message that you would give on the day of your death, is that the message you are giving with your life? And if not, is it time to flip the script and begin to live for that message? Now, what I hope is that by the end of this series, you will be able to answer the question, what do I want? And when I ask you, what do you want? I am not asking you, what do you need? Because when it comes to needs, we're all the same. We all need air to breathe and food to eat, a place to sleep, a sense of security, a sense of self-worth, someone to love, someone to love us. When it comes to needs, we're all the same. It's your wants that make you different. It's your wants that determine where you go in life. It's your wants that determine who you are, the story that you live. And so what I hope is that this series will cause you to think, what do I truly want? What do I want my story to be? What gift do I want to bring into the world? What do I want the message of my life to say? Now, we're going to, in this first message, as we begin the series, I'm going to try to get you to think through how have you been trying to answer that question, and then maybe how we should answer that question. We're going to get into this by watching a clip from a movie called American Beauty. And in it, the main character... Kevin Spacey character, he realizes that he's not living the story that he wants to live, and he begins to think about living a different story. So let's watch this, and if you're watching online, you won't be able to see this content, but we'll be back. Go get a cup of coffee, come back, we'll be with you in a minute. It's never too late to get it back. Now, it sounds very hopeful, and it is. He's in a bad spot, he's in a dark place, but at least... He's aware of it. At least he's asking the question, what is it? How do I get it back? How do I begin to rewrite my story? And that puts him ahead of a lot of people, I think. There's four different ways that people handle this question. What do I really want? What story do I want to tell with my life? And one that is all too common, many people just never even really ask the question. They get on the same track as everyone else, and they feel like that's pretty much all there is to life. So they get an education, they get a job, uh, many get married, begin to raise a family, they pursue a career, they begin to have some success, and they try to be a good person. And that's, that's not a bad story to live, not at all. I mean, if you are a good person, if you're a good husband and father, if you're a good mother, If you're a good wife, if you are a good friend, if you're a good brother, sister, son, or daughter, if you're a good person, you don't have to be ashamed of that story. That's a good story. 
But I wonder if you ask this question, what do I really want? What do I want to bring into the world? What story do I want to tell? I wonder if that's going to be enough for you to say, well, I've got a good job. I'm respected at work. I've got a nice house. You know, we even have pruning shears and gardening clogs, and they even match. And you should see the roses in my garden. I just think that if you begin to ask this question, what do I really want? I think that's not going to be enough for you. I don't think the American dream, as wonderful as it is, I don't think it's going to be enough to fulfill the deepest longings of your heart because I think God created you not for the American dream but for a kingdom dream. A dream that will bring goodness into this world for others. A dream that will make God and his grace known. A dream that will change lives and that will fulfill the deepest yearnings, the spiritual yearnings within your heart. But that's what many people do. They just never really ask the question. Get on the same track as everyone else and think this is what life is and I'm doing just fine. Now other people, they handle this question. If they begin to ask it, it's a hard question to answer for many of us. And when you realize that you don't know the answer, you're in this universe and you do not have a purpose that gives you a real sense of significance, it's a painful place to be. And many people, what they do is instead of pressing through and continuing to seek that answer, they just try to make the pain go away. And they very often turn to the pleasures of the flesh. That's what the Kevin Spacey character ends up doing. I mean, it sounds so hopeful. It's never too late to get it back. But what does he do? If you know the movie, you know that he quits his job. He becomes enamored with his teenage daughter's friend. He begins to work out to impress her. He begins to smoke pot, and he drops all of the responsibilities of his adult life. And all he does is end up making himself look foolish and juvenile in the sight of others. But that's what many people do. Somewhere along the way, they feel like I've lost something. I don't know what it is, but I want to feel alive again. I don't want to feel sedated. I don't want to feel dead. And so they turn to the things that will make them feel differently. That pain inside, they try to drink it away, drug it away, sex it away, food it away, succeed it away, shop it away. Uh, Some people, they don't turn to the actual pleasures of the flesh, but they will turn to some kind of emotional affair. Uh, Someone who thinks you're wonderful and tells you that you're wonderful. It's really helpful if that person never gets to know you really well. Uh, They can continue to tell you that you're wonderful that way. Uh, I have a lot of people who think I'm terrific, just none of them know me all that well. Uh, those that do know that I'm, I'm just a regular little mess trying to, trying to find my way and tell my story in a way that glorifies God. But that's what people do. I, I remember meeting with a woman 20 years ago, another church. Her husband told me she's having an affair. I made an appointment. We saw her. And what she said was so sad and disturbing. I think it was a moment of revelation for her. She said, yeah, I'm having an affair, and I don't really know why. She said, I I don't think it's about the other man. It's certainly not about the sex. I I think it's because I haven't felt anything for so long. It's been years since I felt anything for my husband or I felt anything for my job or even felt anything for myself. I think I'm having this affair because I just want to see if I can feel something again. Can I tell you that if you feel dead inside, if you feel sedated inside, if you feel anxious inside, if you feel unfulfilled inside, that maybe the solution is not turning to something that changes how you feel for a minute? and then has to be repeated, and then repeated, and then you have to go to something different. Maybe the answer is to find something that will bring you alive. Maybe it's to find something that will speak to the depths of your heart and call forth life from you so that you can step into life and pursue it passionately, purposefully, with joy. Maybe that's your answer finding a story worthy of you. 
Now, the other way that people deal with this question is that they simply get distracted. They once desire something great, they commit themselves to it, but somewhere along the way they get lost, they get distracted. Something small begins to take their attention. It, it may be a hobby, it may be golf, it may be poker, that's my hobby. It, it might be learning about the fine wines of the world or travel, and all of a sudden you begin to explore these areas, you get some mastery over them, you get better, you get to the place where people are asking you about these things, you do them well, and all of a sudden you think, hey look, I'm doing pretty good. I'm a pretty good poker player. The other boys think so. I'm, I'm winning. This is good. I'm, I got that going for me, right? And we can take little things, things that are okay, and we can turn them into big things without realizing these little things become our big story. And the way we end up there is we simply get distracted. I'm going to show you a clip from a movie called Up in the Air. If you haven't seen it, you'd probably enjoy it. I think guys and gals both would. And in this movie, George Clooney, uh, he has created a life for himself that has no real attachments, nobody, nothing that slows him down, that keeps him from going where he wants to go in life. And he is, he is a life on the go. Every morning he gets up, he gets on an airplane, and he flies to another destination for his work. His work, he likes it fine, but it's not really all that fulfilling. Uh, he has relationships with women. They're pretty meaningless affairs, but they bring brief moments of happiness and pleasure. But he's really living life on his own. But he has a goal. He has something he's living for. Now, when I share it with you, when you see the clip, you're going to think it's kind of small. You're going to think it's kind of silly. But for him... It means the world. Let's watch. <laughs> so how is the George Clooney character, how is he keeping score? And that's what he's doing, literally. He's accumulating points. He's getting ahead of others. Frequent flyer miles. Now, if you were to ask him, what's your goal in life? And he said to get 10 million frequent flyer miles, you'd say, oh, um, wow, um, yeah. Oh, good, good for you. Great. How does someone get to the place where they measure their lives by frequent flyer miles? Or by the house they live in? Or the car they drive? Or the watch on their wrist? Or how many chicks they bed? Or the title on their door? They get distracted from the story that's in their heart from the life they were meant to live, from the gift that they were created to bring into this world. They don't even realize what they're doing. Do you think when that George Clooney character, when he was uh, a young man just out of college, do you think if someone had put their arm around him and say, son, look, this is a great, big, beautiful world. It's full of all kinds of opportunities. You can do anything you set your mind to. You can live any life, have any adventure, tell any story, have any goal. What is it that you're going to cause your life to revolve around? Do you think there's any chance in the world this young man says, frequent flyer miles? <laughs> that is what I am living for. How do you end up there? You get distracted. Some little thing becomes a big thing, and it hides that deeper reason that you're here from you. Look, here's what I plead with you. Do not make your story smaller than it should be. I'm, I'm not saying don't do small things, but don't make it revolve around things that in the light of eternity will not matter to you one bit. They don't matter to other people right now, and in the light of eternity, they will not matter to you. Don't make that your story. You get one life, you get one chance to tell this story. Eternity is happening right now. Write a story that you want told forever. How do we begin to move into that? Well, we try to deal with this question, what do I want in a different way? And I'm gonna suggest that you begin this process and you kind of work through it over the next uh, six weeks. The first thing I would encourage you to do is take responsibility. 
Nobody can ask the question for you, what do I want? Nobody can answer that question for you. Only you can. Sometimes when somebody begins to tell you about a movie, the story, you say, wait a second, who are the leads? Who's the leading man? Who's the leading woman? In, in case you haven't figured it out, you are the lead in your own story. You are the leading man. You are the leading woman. You're not an extra. You're not a bit player. You are the hero in your own life. And no one is going to live it for you. No one is going to take responsibility for that story but you. And that means if you are the lead, you must lead your life. You must decide that you are responsible for it. Your past is not responsible. Your hurts are not responsible for it. Your present circumstances are not responsible for it. Your spouse is not responsible for it. You are. And you take responsibility for asking the question, doing the work, of finding an answer, and living the life that you were created to live. Take responsibility. Now, let me tell you how this works. I've been a pastor a long time, I know. You can sit in this series six weeks. You can hear some great stories. And some of you, you're going to be inspired to look at your life, to ask that question, to wrestle with it so that your life has changed and it goes in a direction that you never imagined and it's much better than you had ever hoped for. And others of us, we're going to hear the very same stories. We're going to hear the very same messages. And we're not even going to think to ask the question. We may be entertained, we may even be inspired, but we won't even ask the question, what do I want? Which of those two groups will you be in? You decide, you are responsible for that. Second thing I would encourage you to do is to take an honest inventory. So remember that non-creepy stalker who was watching you? You be that person. Take 15 minutes this week and look at your life, where you spend your time, how you spend your money, relationships you've nurtured, you've walked away from, what you're doing to pursue God, whether you're serving, if so, how. You look at your life, not your thoughts, not what you think you believe or feel. You look at the life that you're living and then answer for yourself. If I didn't know that person, I would think what is most important to him or to her is this. This is the story that that life is telling. Honesty about where we are, there is nothing that is more essential than that. We've got to find out where we are so we can end up in a different place. So take an honest inventory. Sometimes what I've heard from uh, lofters is one thing I like about this community is the pastors very often give us something practical to do this week. Well, this is one of the pastors giving you something very practical to do this week that will make a real difference in your life. Take an inventory. I've got to do the same thing. I've been very upfront that just like you, I am a work in progress. I have been very upfront that just like you, I'm a mess. I'm assuming that you are a mess. I know some people who think they're not messes. They're the biggest messes, okay? <laughs> They really are. <laughs> they're fun to see, but they're probably not fun to live with, but they are fun to see. And, and so all of us, we're a mess. I may be up on stage, but I am not up on a pedestal. So I have to make certain that I don't get distracted, that I don't turn to other things, that I don't forget to ask the question. I've already started doing this, and we'll do some more this week. Take 15 minutes, inventory your life, figure out the story that you're telling. The third thing that I would ask you to do is begin to ask the question, what do I want? What do I care about? When I search my heart of hearts, what is it that I believe I am in this world to do? Now look with me at this passage. This is uh, Jesus speaking, Matthew chapter 7. He says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find, knock and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Now, the Greek verbs in this passage, this is me getting to use my $20,000 worth of education in the Greek language in seminary. I get to use that about once a year, so here we go. Uh, the, it's called the present tense, and what that means is not something that's happening right now. In Greek, the present tense means something that is happening now and that will continue to happen. It's continuous action. 
And so what Jesus here is saying, ask and keep asking, seek and keep seeking, knock and keep knocking, and it will be revealed to you. It will be given to you. So the next time I see you and I say, hey, what's your purpose? What's the story you're supposed to tell? I don't expect you to have an answer, but it will come to you. If you will ask, God, what am I to do? What am I here for? What is the story I'm supposed to tell? If you will open your eyes and be seeking what it is that God has for you. Do that and it will come. You're going to find yourself all of a sudden feeling deeply about something you see or something you read. And you'll say, where did that come from? You'll see some need and you'll discover there's a tender place in your heart for that, or for that group of people. You'll see something going on and you'll think, somebody should do something about that. Somebody will invite you to help them out with something and you won't want to go and you'll be in the middle of it and all of a sudden your spirit will just be overwhelmed with, I can make a difference here. Seek be open, be asking God, what have you created me for? What is the story that I'm meant to tell? And then uh, the fat last thing uh, that I would ask you to do is to pray. I've written a prayer for us. I'm going to read it to you, and then I'm going to close up with another clip from up in the air, and then I'm going to ask you the second time to pray the prayer with me. But the prayer that I have for us is, Lord God, you are my creator, and you know me better than I know myself. Reveal to me who I am to be, what I am to do, what message I am to give, what gift I am to bring into the world, big or small, public or private, reveal it to me, and even before I know what it is, my promise to you is, I will do your will. So the movie Up in the Air, George Clooney, he hits his 10 million miles. And sure enough, he's right there in first class, and Maynard Finch, the head pilot, walks out of the cockpit, sits right down next to him, congratulates him, pulls out a card that only six other people in the history of the world have ever gotten. Confers upon him lifetime executive status. And you know what? Turns out it wasn't all that fulfilling. <laughs> Turns out it was a little bit of a lit down wasn't all that satisfying. And something else happens in the movie. He finally falls in love with a woman who's just like him. And when he gets too clingy, too needy, when he wants a relationship, she drops him the way that he has done so many others. And he begins to think through his life, how he's lived, and what does he want. Now, the movie, I think, ends up in a very cool way. Remember Anna Kendrick, his apprentice, what she said she would do if she got all those miles? Here's how the movie ends. Let's watch. That's you, brother. That's you, sister. You and I, we just walked into the airport this morning. And we looked up at this huge board. And there are all these destinations that we could go all these adventures we could live, all these stories that we could tell. Don't live one that's too small for you. Don't live one that doesn't matter. Do not give your life to a story that's not in your heart. Don't get distracted. Search your heart. There's a story that God put in there that needs to be told that the world is dying to hear that will bring grace and goodness and life and will bring Jesus into the lives of others. Last day of your life, you gather around you the people that you love and they say, what's your message to us? Wait a second, we know. We've seen your life. We know what's important. Thank you for living the story that God created you to tell. That's where I want you to be. Let's finish together by praying this prayer that I wrote for us to pray. Let's pray together. Lord God, you are my creator and you know me better than I know myself. Reveal to me who I am to be, what I am to do, 
what message I am to give, what gift I am to bring into the world, big or small, public or private, reveal it to me. And even before I know what it is, my promise to you is I will do your will.